Welcome to today's webinar with eLotus, the foremost provider of acupuncture continuing education. I'm Donna Chow, your host and your moderator for this session. We take pride in hosting continuing education seminars for over two decades, and today's class is going to be a special treat for you. Why, you ask? We have the honor of featuring one of the country's top Chinese acupuncturists who has over 50 years of clinical experience and is over 80 years old. He has studied under several masters in China from the end of the Cultural Revolution until the 1990s. At his semi-retired state, he is still seeing patients but more eager to impart this extensive knowledge on achieving optimal acupuncture results with all of you. He feels the need to pass down his knowledge to the next generation of acupuncturists. Prepare to learn from one of the most experienced and skilled practitioners in the field. And thank you for joining us for this special opportunity. Today's session is sponsored by Evergreen Herbs and is the third or the last of his three classes, Asha Points for Arthritis and Joint Pain, Master Lessons of Over 50 Years, presented by Dr. Kai Fong Dao. Class will run from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific Time, and we will have a break in between. Before we begin, let's ensure that we are all set up for an engaging and informative session. For the chat room, please set your chat preference to everyone so that all attendees can see your messages and join the conversation. If you have any questions for the instructor, please type them into the Q&A box. After the session, a quiz will be available the following working day, and we will send an email notification once it's ready. Please do note that Dr. Dow will be, will be speaking in Chinese, and a translator will be providing consecutive interpretation in English. This setup is similar to studying at a TCM hospital in China, where you can observe everything the teacher does in the clinic with the aid of a translator. We kindly ask for your patience as Dr. Dow speaks slowly and has difficulty hearing due to his age. We'll have a Q&A session throughout the class, so feel free to ask any questions. There are no silly questions. We're all working towards becoming better practitioners, and I'm very excited and hope you are too. Let's begin this unparalleled learning experience. Good morning, everyone. How are you today? Can you guys type into the chat room for me if you can hear me okay? Please type okay. Good. Okay, wonderful. So like Donna says, this is our third class Dr. Dell is having and with us and sharing his clinical experience and I'm excited. Well, sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah. Technology is, um, you know, for somebody 80 is a little different than technology for a 10 year old. And I feel like 82 because of all the AI stuff that's going around now. I feel like, wow, how am I ever going to catch up to this? It's moving so fast. <laughs> Here, Sam, please. Can you turn it off? Thank you. Maybe it's a patient. Okay, anyway, sorry about that. No, so today's class, um, I'm just going to do a little bit of intro because I think most of you have already uh, been to his previous two classes. And I have put down like the key points of his Ashi needling, the important points that you should know, already very um, you know self-explanatory in the notes. So even if I don't go over it in detail, you will get the gist of it just by reading. And if you want to know more, you can always go back to his first class where I elaborated a little bit more. But the importance of today's lecture or lecture is um, the demo portion where we actually see how does he do the ashi needling. Because in school, you think that ashi needling is so easy, right? Wherever the patient says there's pain, you just needle there. And that's what I thought too. But it's a lot more extensive than that because there is it involves how to find the ashi point, how to hold the ashi point, and how to get the dirty sensation. And all of that you will see today as we go over how to treat um, four patients with different types of joint pain. Okay, so let me briefly go over the key points and then we'll get started with the demo, okay? So we're gonna go over, like I was telling you, the key points first, and then we're gonna do demo, and then from there, the Q&A, and then also if Dr. Dale has any advice today for new practitioners. So there's so many different styles of acupuncture. 
Dr. Dell has also studied with many different teachers in China. And finally, at the end, he tells me that the best method that he finds that is the simplest and most effective is Ashi needling. And that's what he has been practicing, and that's what he wants to share with you today, because he feels like everything that he has learned should not just, you know, go to the grave with him, and because he, he doesn't have any disciple studying next to him in his clinic. So he feels this is a good opportunity to share what he has learned and pass the baton down to you guys. So learning from a Chinese sifu is a little bit different than learning from an English speaking. Usually when you're you know, learning from an English speaking teacher, you go to a seminar, you pay your tuition, and then they'll teach you whatever it is. But um, from a Chinese teacher is a little bit different. Usually when you are approach them cold turkey like that, there's no Chinese teacher who will just take you as a disciple. They want to decide if you're qualified to be their student, you know, and um, also you have the proper ethics and also morals to um, be a good practitioner, and then they will decide whether or not they'll teach you after they take you under their wings. So it's a little bit different. There's a lot more expectation from this kind of um, mm, teacher-disciple relationship that the Chinese culture, um, the teachers expect. Um, but in this setting, we have done all that for you. Um, we have already communicated with the teacher, and then so the expectations are a little bit different because this is not in a clinical setting. So and he also understands that what what um, what we want is for him to share all his knowledge. And he does actually, very bluntly, as I will explain in a little bit um, with some of the um, answers to previous class questions. Um, he sort of doesn't cover anything up and gives you the smoke and mirror answer. He will just tell you as is because he's a very straightforward person. And we like working with that because sometimes teachers who are very elusive are very hard to learn from, you know, spend hours and hours and you still don't know what they're talking about. But that's not Dr. Dell, thank God. So here's his experience, this slide. The next one, okay, so let's get right into it. These are some key steps. So if you are new to today's class, you didn't come to the previous two, just kind of um, have this in the back of your mind. So when you're watching him do the needling, you know, you will remember these tips. I will also mention it too when we're doing the needling, just as a reminder for you, okay? So number one, always he does is ask the patient to identify the most painful point or area with a finger. You know, sometimes patients will say, oh, I have pain here. He'll tell them, okay, use one finger to identify the most painful point. Some patients can, some patients cannot. So you just have to try to tell them to, you know, at least narrow down the area for you. Because what you're trying to do is, number two, palpate for that hardness or that cord. Whatever it is, you know, under the skin that you're feeling that is abnormal compared to other parts is the part that you need to pay attention to. Usually, it's like he says, it's like a, um, like, a, like a knot. And he also mentioned that it's very important, the needling hand usually is the right hand, right, if you're right-handed. The left hand is the, the, the assistant hand, but he says the left hand is more important than the right hand because that is the hand in which you're gonna feel the knot, and then you're going to hold that point or that knot. So that's number three. Number four, hold on to the knot with your left hand. Basically, you're making it steady, don't let it move. And then you needle with your right hand, number four. So that's where the art is. I feel like the hard part of Ashi needling, number one, is finding where that knot is. Because he has asked me to feel his patients when I'm in his clinic, and many times I don't feel any difference. So that's one, that's difficult. Two is the needling part. At which angle do you needle? Which depth do you needle? How do you know you have gotten the dirty sensation and the patient feels like, you know, that sensation of numbness and then, you know, um, uh, tingling or whatever it is that we're looking for, that acupuncture sensation. So to let you know that, yes, it's working. So those, I think, are the two most difficult, okay? <coughs> So right here, I asked him before, so what if you cannot find that knot, then what happens? Then he says, you know, start with wherever the patient is pointing. If you cannot find any knots there, basically expand the area you're searching until you find it. There has to be one. It's impossible that there isn't any. It's probably your finger is not as sensitive. 
but there is definitely going to be something that you have to find. If you still cannot find anything, you will start needling wherever the patient says it's most painful, okay? Next, the needling hand is not as important as the other hand, the stabilizing hand. So especially if you're doing, if you're needling onto a tendon, he says, because the tendon tends to be very slippery. So you need to hold it and stabilize it so that your needle is going exactly where you want it to go. Not to the side of the tendon, you know, but on the tendon itself. Next, the gauge of needle he uses is number 30 because he wants to elicit a very strong stimulation. Usually the stronger the stimulation, the more effective the treatment. So we're looking for that soreness and distended feeling. Number four, he wears gloves when he's palpating and when he's needling because I've seen many times when he, when he extracts a needle, there's some blood that will come out. And then he says that's also a good thing because you know the tension is being released. Number five, use as many needles as you need to to relieve the hardness and the pain. So there's no you know, ego thing here going on where he says, I just need one needle to treat the patient. You know, No such thing. Use as many as you need because the area of pain may be a big area. Number six, so what he does is he works on the most painful area first. And then when he takes out the needle, he'll ask the patient how they feel. If they still have pain, he will then work on them again, finding a secondary area next to it, wherever there is problem. Then he'll continue with that until the patient is completely pain-free then to let them go. Next one is when the, um, does he sensation or the sensation of the soreness, um, the patient feels that when you're needling, uh, you want to needle, it's the, suppose this is the knot, right? So you want to needle through the knot and then break up the knot. Okay, so he'll, he'll demo this. This is kind of hard to, hard to explain in words, but if you see it, um, you'll know what I mean, or how he manipulates the needle to try to break up the knots. But the idea is you don't just touch the knot, you need to penetrate the knot. Okay, next one, for the patients who are very sensitive to needling and very sensitive to pain, what you wanna do is you want to do cupping first. So ask him, why do you do that? You know, how does that make it less painful? Because the patient is still very sensitive to pain. And he says, you know, with the cupping, you desensitize the area. And they already, you know, there's a lot of pressure and then it's being worked on. So then the body sort of knows and prepares itself for what's coming. So it's just kind of like um, like a warm up, if you will. So then, then the patient won't be, you know, as jumpy when you just stick a needle in. Okay, and then number ten is when he when I was talking about earlier that he's very straightforward because I asked him, you know, oh your patients can leave after five minutes, you know, basically after the needling session, you know, when he feels the dirty sensation and he pulls it out and he'll just tell the patient, okay, you're ready to go, you know, sometimes. That whole needling section of the treatment, it may be five minutes, but looking for the ashi point may be 20 minutes, you know. So it, 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 the whole treatment could be as long as 40 minutes or as short as like 10 minutes for him. But the idea is that you don't need to leave the needles in to let the patient rest in the, in the bed because once you have broken up the knot, that is enough. The treatment effect is achieved. And so I asked him also, well, can you still let the patient rest with the needle in? Will that make the treatment like worse or something? And he says, no, it's just like I put down in the, in, in the notes here. He said, they can rest. It's al always good if they fall asleep, you know, and they will feel much more refreshed when they wake up. But also some patients, they want that because they'll feel like they're getting their money's worth. You know, they feel like, hey, why you only need me for five minutes and then I pay a hundred dollars, you know, they don't feel like they're getting their money's worth. So that's another psychological thing when they don't, he will let them go and sleep for an hour or something like that. Okay, number 11. Okay, this method is a little bit different than the regular acupuncture where most acupuncture, if you needle the patient, they'll get relief. And then when they go home, Mm, the effect will slowly wean off. Maybe the pain will come back the next day, but not as much, but it will come back. But his method is when after you needle, after he needles you, you will feel more pain. 
um, sometimes when you go home, you'll feel like, wow, the condition's getting worse. But really, it's not. So what happens is you need to tell the patient, don't worry, next 24 hours, you might feel more pain. But after that, the pain will gradually improve, and then it will be gone. Don't need to come back. Whereas the regular acupuncture, many times, is you get the relief first, but then the pain comes back. I feel like Dr. Dell's um, needling technique is the very traditional Chinese style. Because the very traditional Chinese style is usually, you know, like the toy na, it's very aggressive, very, mm, very painful. Not like the Japanese kind of style, you know, it's very soft and gentle with very thin needles. You will see as he demonstrates. Okay, contraindications. Number one, during pregnancy, you want to not needle the patient. Definitely no needling a month plus. And then also the thoracic points. Pneumothorax could happen very easily, so he advised the new practitioners to not do that. You know, you need a certain practice and certain experience, enough experience to do the points. He did demo that, I think, in the first class, just to show you how it's done. But he doesn't recommend you to do it if you have never done it. But then the catch is, well, if you have never done it and if you don't practice, how are you ever going to do it, right? So I guess the answer is you need to practice um, safely, um, you know, study the anatomy carefully, and then practice um, um, on people that um, I guess are your family or friends first, and practice gently so that you can be more aware of how the tissues feel and what is what you're supposed to do. And then watch this video again, because he gave, I think the first class, very good pointers on how to needle the thoracic points. Okay, next one. Another tip, when there's no obvious pain or not, then you do the bloodletting first. So do the bloodletting, do the cupping, and then you look for the ashi area, because when you let the blood out, the subcutaneous tissue will rearrange a bit. So sometimes the knot will come out, then all will be more obvious then. And then again, uh, please use disposable cups and wear gloves. And another tip here is he said that the more severe the pain, the more holes you can puncture when you're bloodletting. He will show you the pen that he uses and the disposable needle, he likes those, those diabetic needles. Um, usually does like, he pokes like three or five holes for each suction cup, but when the pain is severe, you can do as many as 10 for each suction cup. So the idea is to suck more blood out. Okay. And then he also says when the case is severe, you want to do the cupping and the needling first, and then, you know, find the right spot to needle. Somebody asked this question in the first class, so I put it in the lecture notes. So after, you know, they asked, do you, can you shower? Because some, you know, some, some teachers taught before that you shouldn't shower after you do maksa and do cupping. But he says, you know, it's okay. It's not an absolute no-no after you cup, but it's better not to for 12 hours. And then also, um, you don't need to put any ointment on the, um, the holes where you bled the body will heal itself. So on the areas where you cannot needle, he would like you to do bloodletting. So today we might see that because we're working on joints, smaller joints. The first class was on the neck, second class was on the back. Today we're working on different joints. And also, Gao Huang is somewhere you don't want to be, you know, um, needling. That's the thoracic area. Now, another contraindication uh, are for these patients, diabetic patients and patients who are on blood thinners. He says it's not an absolute no. If you have to, you have to, but just make sure you don't bleed too much because you know they will bleed too much. Okay, so that's all on the tips. And we, before we go into the demo session, I want to ask you guys one question. Now, if you have to needle the joints, the fingers, and the toes or the hands and the feet, you know it's very, it's very sensitive, right? So how do you guys do that so that the patient doesn't feel that much pain? Can you type in the chat room what are your experiences? How do you needle the fingers and the uh, toes, hands and feet? Can I see real quick what you guys do and then I'll tell you what Dr. Dale does. Okay. 
office， people say they use very small needles。我在问他们呐、啊，这个手跟脚啊，要我在问他们手跟脚在扎的时候，他们有什么办法，让他不要那么痛？有一些人说用小针，有一些人用说比较比较 tiny needles。Squeeze, stimulate the area first. Pinch another area of the body. 有的人是说用比较小的针，细的针。有的人说先在按摩这边，让他不要想到你在扎这里手。Okay. 啊，有的人说就是先按摩，然后有的人叫病人先深呼吸这样子，所以也不错，挺好。都都也可以啊，可以。嗯，是可以，都可以。OK。嗯。So he says, "Yeah, you guys are very good. The suggestions you put down are all good." He said, "But、uh, what he does is he, like some of you, massages the area." He says, "Whatever point you want to try to to needle, to desensitize it first, just by massaging it, you know, so the patient get used to it. It's kind of like you're marinating the area, make getting it ready. So then the patient won't feel as much pain." And the next question I ask him is, "Okay, for joint pain now." Um, is it the bone that is painful, or is it the soft tissue? And then he said, almost always, all the joint pain patients actually the pain is in the soft tissue, the lig ligaments or the tendons. It's never the bone that actually has the pain. Very very rare. However, you will see bone problems leading to soft tissue around the bone or around the joint that have pain. But it's never really the bone, so that's one key. So then that's why you do the bloodletting. You're treating the soft tissue. Okay. So let's、um, take a short break. We'll do a five minutes quick break, and then we'll set up the the treatment demo session, and we'll come back with the first patient. All right. Thank you very much.